um, subject to being drafted. They couldn't afford college. And so that wasn't an option for them. And so as a result, you know, the majority, I don't want to say the majority of troops, but population wise, like statistic wise, there is a significant um, percentage of African Americans that were called to service as opposed to whites because the majority, you know, a lot of them had money and they could afford to get out of it. So some draftees would refuse to serve. They would go to Canada. Um, some of them burned draft cards. That's the picture at the top. Um, here's what a draft card looks like. Um, you're re required to report for service by a certain date. And then this is the, the capsules that they would pull for the lottery system. They pull one of these out and then it tells, you know, what date of birth through, you know, what date um, are to report for duty. So they might pull it out and say, if you were born between, you know, May 1st and, you know, June 15th of 1961 or actually it'd be older, let's say 1940, then you're required to report for the draft. And so if your birthday fell in that range, you were required to go there. So here's some signs for protest. Um, it's, it's hard to find, um, or it's not hard to find, but it, I, I just like this. I think this is um, interesting. So why are we fighting in Vietnam? You know, the Vietnamese never did anything to me. Um, of course, popular, you guys have heard this before. Hell no, we won't go fighting back against not our sons, not your sons, not their sons. And the war before it ends you. I won't fight in Vietnam, you know, just refusal to go. And then here is, um, these are troops that have returned home from Vietnam. We won't fight another rich man's war. So a rich man's war, a poor man's fight is what the, the idea was behind this. So you've got two factions developing, doves versus hawks. Doves wanted peace. They wanted the United States out of Vietnam. Hawks felt the United States should stay and fight and actually see this through. So the youth movement of the 60s, kind of looking at activists, and a lot of people say like, oh, these are hippies. No, hippies are a little bit different than... Um, this anti-war movement. The youth movement of the 60s, they wanted peace and prosperity. They were worried about nuclear war. They were um, fighting for the civil rights movement as well. Um, many of them were baby boomers, and a lot of them were enrolled in college. See, hippies weren't enrolled in college. Um, that's something to keep in mind. So some notable protests during this time. Um, at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, thousands of Vietnam War protesters actually ended up getting into a conflict with the Chicago police. Um, and the De Democratic Party actually falls apart over this. They're at the Democratic National Convention and war protesters show up in the convention with signs. Um, I have watched this footage. It's it's a little nerve wracking, to be honest, because you got to remember this is a convention and protesters getting in. It's, it's supposed to be a pep rally for your um, candidate. So this is kind of scary when you watch this. Plus, what happens as a result is pretty um, freaky as well. Unfortunately, the footage from this has a lot of cussing in it when you go and look at it. So um, if you do go check this out on YouTube, just be mindful of that. Um, in 1969, if you've seen Forrest Gump, they actually show this. This is where Forrest Gump gets up and speaks at the rally and his microphone cuts out. And then at the end, he says, that's all I have to say about that. Um, this is the actual rally that they were uh, depicting where at the Vietnam um, or during the Vietnam War, they show up um, to protest the war at the, um, I think it's at the, the Lincoln Memorial, um, at the Reflecting Pond, um, is where they mostly were. But they do show up in D.C. And this is a, a peaceful demonstration, half a million people there. Um, but there are protests all over the country, such as this one. So let's talk a little bit. What, why are hippies different? Um, they didn't really challenge the system of um, the government and said they withdrew from society. And this is the hippie counterculture that we're talking about. They wanted to create their own society. Um, and so they were mostly white youth from middle-aged, um, middle and upper class backgrounds. They lived a flamboyant life, um, a little different. Free love was practiced. Excuse me. They dressed a little strangely. Um, they liked rock music. A lot of them used drugs. LSD was their drug of choice. They promoted um, free and independent living, which basically means... Um, having premarital sex. They would just, you know, sleep with anybody. It didn't matter. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think what video I'm showing this week. Um, there's a clip in the video you're going to watch uh, where one of the a former hippie um, talked about, like, finding a woman and you could, like, look at each other and hold hands and then you might spend an afternoon making love. And I always try to interject there. Um, STDs are real, and that's why you end up with the rise of STDs from this type of lifestyle. Um, and it, it does not work well for the hippies. There's a lot of um, diseases that, you know, are prevalent. That's why if you've ever seen those baby boomer commercials about um, hepatitis, you know, and it's these old people, well, that's because the baby boomers, a lot of them, not all of them, practice free love um, and had intravenous drug use. I know my mom is 72 coming up, and... Um, she was asked at her doctor's uh, doctor's appointment over the summer, like, oh, maybe you should get this shot. And my mom said, well, who gets it? And they said, well, 
you know, have you ever had unprotected sex with, you know, multiple partners? Have you, um, were you ever an intravenous drug user? You know, did you ever, and she like rattled off these things and my mom was horrified. She was like, no, 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 absolutely not. She's like, okay, and then you don't need it. She goes, but you'd be surprised how many elderly people say yes to some of those questions and therefore should get the shot to protect them. So that's kind of interesting. Sorry, little fun facts about grandma. Um, hopefully not your grandparents, but you never know. Um, so the hippies here, you can see they're living, you know, they've got the teepee out there. They're living as part from society. That's kind of their big idea, big theme. Woodstock actually is a hippie uh, music festival. And it's, it's yes, it's anti-war because the hippies did not agree with the war, but they weren't necessarily protesting um, in the same way. You know, some did. This is kind of a, a wishy-washy um, kind of general idea. Hippies kind of did what they wanted is the, the basic part. Um, they weren't concerned about cutting their hair. They weren't, you know, concerned they wear blue jeans or shabby jeans. Well, keep in mind, most schools didn't allow students to wear blue jeans um, until the, the 70s. You know, I know my parents, when they went to school, my dad talked about he wasn't allowed to wear blue jeans. He had to wear slacks and he didn't go to a private school. He went to a public school. Um, they would reject materialism from the 50s. They would embrace spirituality. They had long hair, Native American headbands. Like I said, drugs were common. So 68 is a turning point um, for the war effort. The Lunar New Year, um, or Chinese New Year as we all kind of refer to it as, is important in Asia um, as their big celebration. Christmas isn't their big winter celebration. It's actually the Lunar New Year. Um, and so the Vietnamese had asked the U.S. troops, could they have a break for that month to bury dead and celebrate the Lunar New Year? Americans agreed. Um, however, secretly they're planning a surprise attack. So on January 30th, during the Tet, which is their New Year, um, they launched a surprise attack against... Um, the South Vietnamese, they attack simultaneously all these cities. Now, here's the problem. Americans have been told the war was almost over. And because of this, we see that clearly it is not. So the guerrilla fighters hit American air bases as well as the capitals, like we said. Um, and ultimately, Americans end up winning all of these back really quickly. I think within a month, um, America had control of all those places and the majority of them like within a week. Um, however, because Americans have been told the war was over, or close to being over, light at the end of the tunnel, as um, our, our military advisors had said, um, it, it appears that it's not. If the, they're strong enough to do this campaign, then clearly, you know, we're not as strong as we are letting on. Um, over here, you can see this actually is an execution, and they did have this on TV. That's why it's this picture. Um, you have an American troop that ends up shooting this Vietnamese, which he is Viet Cong. He was a uh, Viet Cong prisoner. But look, he's not wearing a uniform. You know, his face is curled. Um, and so a lot of Americans would sympathize with some of these communists and say, like, what did he do to you? You know, he hasn't done anything. Or in this case, he probably has. But he doesn't look like a typical soldier. So as a result, the 60s, 60 is a bad time for the United States. Um, the approval rating for Johnson plummets. He actually withdrew from the presidential race. King is assassinated. Two months later, Kennedy is assassinated. It kind of sounds like um, what a lot of people are saying right now, you know, with everything that's happening and going on. You know, we had Kobe that died. Um, of course, you know, Australia was on fire earlier this year. You know, there's just been one bad thing after another. And that's how 68 was. But instead of being, you know, some natural disasters and some natural, you know, phenomenons that are happening, instead, this is just like people. Like, what is wrong with people? Um, so King's assassinated. RFK is assassinated. You have violence at the Democratic Convention. Um, that clash. And so this chaos prompted Nixon to actually rise in power, um, promising to regain order and end the war in Vietnam. So ultimately, Nixon wins by not a landslide, but a significant margin, ultimately because he promises to get us out of the war. Um, Vietnam was called the television war because a lot of Americans would sit down and watch on their TVs what was happening. And that's going to give them, you know, their opinion of what's going on. Um, here you have a chart. You can tell total killed in action or total troops deployed and killed in action. Um, 1968 is the peak. So this is considered a turning point in the war, a turning point for the worst. Most of our turning points have been successful the, for the U.S. in this case. It's, it's, it's not going to go so well. Um, so our troop deployments in Vietnam are at its peak again. So Nixon proposes this policy of Vietnamization, where he's going to gradually withdraw troops from Vietnam. Um, and then South Vietnam would resume fighting in our place. So peace negotiations are underway, but Nixon is increasing airstrikes. In the midst of that, Americans learned of an event in 68 that increased their feelings that this was a senseless war. Um, there was an American platoon under command of Lieutenant William Calais um, that had massacred more than 200 unarmed South Vietnamese civilians, think women, children, elderly, um, in this area called My Lai. And the My Lai massacre um, 
was pretty brutal. These people were not enemies. Um, it was said later on when they talked to Calais and the troops that were there and, and participated in this that um, more than likely they had post-TSD or post-TSD, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Um, doesn't excuse it. It just explains it a little bit. And it also showed troop frustration over the fact that this war was just not um, pleasant for a lot of these troops and, and a lot of troops didn't want to be there. Um, so these pictures are released. Um, they actually do, you know, show his trial on TV and Americans are even more convinced that, hey, we need to get out of here. So in April of 1970, Nixon announces that troops had invaded Cambodia, which is going to further anger Americans because they see this as um, an expansion of the war. And so they protest. The first two pictures here that you see, um, these are Kent State um, pictures from the Kent State shootings. Um, at Kent State University in Ohio, it's actually about 30 minutes from where I grew up. I have been there. I've actually walked on campus and seen these plaques and memorials just, I hate to say for fun because it's a very sobering thing. Um, but you kind of have to understand like what happens and how we get to this point. So the night before the Kent State shootings, the ROTC building on campus that they had was actually burned down. The protesters met, they lit it on fire, and they watched it burn. And Kent State told the students stay in your dorms. You have no classes tomorrow. They've been canceled. You are to gather your things. Stay inside. Um, and we don't think we are going to resume classes, but you stay inside until this whole thing kind of blows over. Well, one, a lot of students didn't care because they wanted to protest, so they left their dorms. Some students left because they were curious. Some stayed in place like they were supposed to. Um, the other thing to note is that it wasn't just Kent State protesters. There were also people that came in from the outside. For example, this girl here that you see, she's not a Kent State student. She's actually a Florida teenage runaway um, that made her way up to the protests and just happened to be there. They snapped this iconic picture of the K Kent State University shootings, um, and she's not a student. She's just a protester that's there. Um, but what ends up happening is that the protesters are, are being tear gassed, and the students are... Um, or the protesters are throwing bottles and rocks and things into the National Guard. Um, I had a teacher that always joked about his, um, like, rock throwing theory. And he always said, like, hey, if you ever um, are in a protest and people start throwing things at armed guards, like, run. Because it never ends well. History shows. Um, there's similar protests, um, like Kent State at the University of Louisiana. Or, I'm sorry, Louisiana State. Um, and then also kind of what fuels this or adds to it or makes people say like, oh, maybe, you know, they're not crazy, is that in 70, the Congress um, repealed the Tonkin Golf Resolution, giving the president that power. But in 71, there's information released called the Pentagon Papers that showed that the government knew that we really weren't winning over there and that they kept lying to the American public. Um, and so... It, Really, it, it shows that the government was willing to lie to the American public, and they were deceiving them on purpose. So by 71, about two-thirds of Americans went out of the war. Link, Lincoln, Nixon, excuse me, um, said, hey, we're going to drop this insistence that the North Vietnamese have to get out of South Vietnam, on Vietnam before a peace treaty. Um, and so about a month before his election, there's peace is announced. We're almost there. We're getting close. So Nixon wins re-election in a landslide. At the Paris Peace Accords, um, this finally will end U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Terms included withdrawing troops within 60 days, releasing prisoners of war, um, parties would end military action in Cambodia and Laos, and then the 17th parallel would divide the two. So after withdrawal, fighting resumes, North Vietnamese um, ends up going into South Vietnam and capturing it. Saigon, Saigon becomes Ho Chi Minh City. And Vietnam now is a communist country. In other words, the campaign containment policy has failed. This is the fall of Saigon, um, where people are trying to leave. Little palace. And you can see that was just a... So the impact. Um, Vietnam is unified under communism. You have 3 million Vietnamese killed. Um, see how much money we spent in the war? $150 billion. And this is kind of the big impact here. Americans changed attitude about war and our involvement. And then finally, the 26th Amendment, this is a positive out impact, is that it lowers the voting age to 18. Idea was if you can be drafted at 18, then why can't you vote for the people that are sending you um, to war? So a lot of soldiers that return home have psychological problems. Some families are left uncertain about what happened with their loved ones. Players knew of war and MIAs, you know, weren't accounted for. Um, and Americans question values. They start questioning the government. This is a picture of John McCain returning home. So Congress then passes this War Powers Act that limited the president's power. Um, here's what they have to do. If they go abroad and put troops over there, Congress has to be notified within two days. And then every 60 to 90 days, Congress has to approve this in order for them to stay. Again, Americans start questioning their government and their leaders. Um, keep in mind, Vietnam is not recognized until 1995 by Bill Clinton. 
Here's a picture of the Vietnam War Memorial. All right, so some lessons for future presidents. I'm not going to read these to you. We are done, guys. Good work. I'm